Thank you, Incognate, for sponsoring this episode. It is September 27th, and 158 years ago today, on September 27th, 1865, a circus clown by the name of James Cook walked a tightrope that had been strung between a restaurant called the Cliff House and a rock called Seal Rock over a portion of San Francisco Bay. According to the San Francisco Examiner, when he got to the other side, he was greeted with raucous applause. And the feat was all the more dangerous because, as the newspaper The Alta California noted, Mr. Cook didn't know how to swim. But his feat of funambulism, the technical term for tightrope walking, was not really all that impressive, because during the 19th century, the ancient activity achieved all sorts of new and sometimes ridiculous heights. It is history that deserves to be remembered. History deserves to be remembered, but your personal information, things like your address and your phone number, will not so much. You know, it's happened to me lots of times. I'm working online, and I sign up for something, or I fill something out, and then all of a sudden I start getting the unwanted emails and ads and phone calls because my personal information is wound up in the hands of some data broker. Trying to protect yourself online sometimes seems like you are walking a tightrope with every click potentially leaving you open to scams, threats to your privacy, and shadow profiles who will try to manipulate your buying habits or your politics. Your personal information is not a story that you want to include pirates. So there are privacy laws to protect you that can force these data brokers to take your information down, but you have to know who to contact, and there's dozens of them, and you have to know what to say to overcome their objections. And who has the time or the know-how to do that? Well, incogni does. And thank you, Incogni, for sponsoring this episode. Incogni is an automated data removal tool, and it's so easy to use. All you got to do is sign up, and they will figure out which of these data brokers has your personal information, and they will pursue them and force them to take your private information off their database. It didn't take me two minutes to sign up, and as soon as I signed up, the tool went to work. And within seconds, the tool sent removal requests to 76 data brokers, and my data removed from 10 of those. And the tool will keep working and giving me updates, and I don't have to do anything. So go to incogni.com slash the history guy and use the code the history guy to get a screaming deal of 60% off an annual plan. That is incogni.com slash the history guy and use the code the history guy or use the link below and take your personal information off the market. On March 16th, 1866 edition of the Illustrated Sydney News profiled James Cook, noting that he was born in Dublin and at the age of 12 commenced training for the profession in which he was to the manner born. Mr. Cook was a circus clown, but apparently not the run-of-the-mill type, the news continues. For hackneyed as the business was, and is, Mr. Cook opened up an entirely new sphere and most successfully demonstrated that a clown is not necessarily a fool. Notably, Cook was, the news opined, one of the most talented gymnasts that ever visited the country, as well as a model clown. After a successful run in New York, Cook and his circus, the news writes, toured the principal cities in the north and thence to California. It was there that he performed his high-wire act above San Francisco Bay. Mr. Cook, demonstrating the foibles of funambulism, had had to delay his walk. Originally, he had intended to do the walk on the previous Sunday, but the San Francisco Examiner wrote, the wind was blowing keenly from the south, and to make the situation all the more disagreeable, rain began to fall. And to crown all, Cook failed to walk the rope. Everybody was mad, wet, dirty, and disappointed, and the swearing of the crowd rivaled that of the famous army in Flanders. The Sacramento Bee reported that Cook said, The wind was too high, but I will certainly do it next Wednesday. And in order to do so, I have postponed my departure for Australia until after that day. The Bee added a bit of sting to its report. Today is Wednesday, and if the wind does not blow too hard, Cook will walk his rope. Of course, San Francisco will be depopulated, and there won't be a hack left in town to carry home a fat woman who might faint in the street. But that's none of Cook's business. The walk did indeed occur on Wednesday, but it didn't go without incident. The Contra Costa Gazette reported that at a quarter past twelve, Cook started out from the cliff house on the rope, walked steadily forward until he arrived within a hundred feet of the rock when one of the guys broke, nearly throwing him off his feet. Quick as the thought, he soon dropped his balance pole and reached the rock in safety. The trip back from the rock was without incident, the Gazette writes. After passing the center, coming up the home stretch, Cook hastened his step and as he walked up was received by the multitude with great applause. But not everyone was impressed. The bee buzzed, now this funambulism is getting to be a stale entertainment. It wasn't an idle complaint. 
Mr. Cook's feet came at a time when the ancient art of tightrope walking was reaching new heights. The website of Valencia Slacklines notes the age of the daredevil activity. Ancient plaster paintings buried for 1,700 years under the same volcanic ash that buried the ancient city of Pompeii depict what look like small demons walking what are unmistakably tightropes stretched over A-frames, a structure slackliners still use today. The discovery stretches the written or painted record of tightrope walking as far back as A.D. 79. Historian Oriana Leckert explained in Atlas Obscura in 2014 that funambulism dates back at least to ancient Greece. That's where the name comes from. Funi means rope, and ambulare means to walk. The high wire was highbrow in late medieval and early modern Europe, with Leckert noting that an acrobat carrying candles walked along a rope suspended from the spires of the cathedral to the tallest house in the city at the coronation of Queen Isabeau in Paris in 1389. Funambulist also performed at the coronation of Edward VI of England in 1547 at the occasion of Philip of Spain's arrival in London to meet Queen Mary in 1554. But, Leckert notes... During the late 1600s in England, tightrope walkers began to be associated with a disreputable element, including pickpockets, streetwalkers, and conmen. But nothing put the fun in funambulism like the new 19th century fad. Like it writes, in the 1800s, everybody wanted to walk across Niagara Falls. It was the unbelievable feats at the famous falls that led the Sacramento Bee to be nonplussed with Cook's walk across his wire, with the paper noted, Niagara has had her foaming cataracts banned with elastic cords. The feats of fancy above the foaming cataract began six years before Cook's balancing act above the bay. American Heritage writes that on Thursday, June 30th, 1859, the atmosphere at Niagara Falls was charged with excitement. A slightly built Frenchman, dressed in tights and carrying a long balancing pole, was planning to attempt the impossible. He was going to walk across the terrible gorge of the Niagara River at about a mile below the falls on a slender rope cable, 190 feet above the swift and boiling flood. As they watched in fascination, shading their eyes with their parasols, ladies in crinolines nearly swooned. Strong men in top hats and stocks were tense, for many had wagered large sums on the outcome. Little girls clung to the skirts of their nurses and small boys skylarked. 300,000 people, or was it 10,000, held their breath as Jean-Francois Gravelet, better known as Blondine, edged out onto the sloping cable. A Frenchman, born in 1824, American Heritage writes that physically Blondine was a small man, distinguished by the blue eyes and the blonde hair that had given him his nickname. He stood only 5 feet 5 and weighed a mere 140 pounds. Nimble and wiry, he had developed superb coordination on the tight wire during years of experience in theaters and circuses. He possessed imagination and courage and tremendous self-assurance, even enough courage and assurance to perform without a single slip the fantastic acts that were the fruit of his imagination. He began experimenting on the tightrope when he was five years old. But it was over Niagara that he would gain his fame. American Heritage continues. There were restaurants and drinking places and Punch and Judy shows and two-headed calves and bearded ladies. It was a place made to order for Blondine. Sadly, given the level of daring do, the crowd was disappointing the first time he crossed. Something the Buffalo Courier explained. It was owing to the general cry of humbug which caused so slim an attendance. Although the Courier notes that the thing was fairly and bravely done. No one who saw it can for a moment doubt. But, the courier noted, we learned that Monsieur Blondine will give another performance of a similar kind on the 4th of July, when the probability is that there will be a largely increased attendance. And there was. But the performance on the 4th was not just similar, but far more. American Heritage writes, The river scene, when that holiday arrived, must have been a strange one. Every vantage point, every tree, every rock, as well as every seat in the grandstands, was occupied by a huge crowd, morbidly confident that Blondine would lose his balance and plunge into the Niagara Gorge. They never took their eyes off him, lest they miss the awful moment. Betting on the outcome was said to have been huge. At the appointed hour, Blondine appeared at the American end of the cable with his 38-foot balancing pole. Halfway across, he lay down full length on the cable, putting one foot above the other. He walked backwards, swiftly, balanced on one foot, extended the other and also his body over the boiling flood. He whirled himself around as if he'd been on a pivot stool, and repeated this in the center of the cable, took a flask from his pocket and drank, and then completed his journey. And that was just the start. On the 15th, he crossed the wire walking backwards, and then pushing a wheelbarrow. On August 3rd, he crossed while performing a number of tricks, including standing on his head and a backward somersault. And on August 17th, he set a new standard, crossing the 1,200-foot cable while carrying his manager, Harry Colcord, on his back. The act nearly went wrong when, as with Cook, one of the guide wires broke, but wire man and manager managed a safe recovery. 
and his tricks went on. American heritage continues. Once he crossed with baskets on his feet and shackles on his body. And another time he carried a table and chair and tried to seat himself on the chair with two of its legs balanced on the cable. And the chair fell into the Niagara and Blondine nearly tumbled after. He regained his balance, sat down on the cable and ate a piece of cake, washed down with champagne. In another trick, Smithsonian Magazine writes, he carried a stove and utensils on his back, walked to the center of the cable, started a fire and cooked an omelet. When it was ready, he lowered the breakfast to the passengers on the deck of the Maid of the Mist. Bondine became known as the hero of Niagara, and it's easy to see how the bee was less than impressed with Mr. Cook merely crossing a wire. Blondine's fame, however, inspired numerous imitators, creative people in their own right. One of those, a New York native named William Leonard Hunt, who performed under the name The Great Farini, duplicated many of Blondine's stunts, including crossing the falls while carrying a man on his back that the Buffalo Courier described as a Canadian from Bowmansville, Macmillan by name, a head taller than the acrobat. But Farini did Blondine one better, if not in skill, at least in sheer oddity. Leckert writes that his coup de grace in 1860 was crossing the falls with a washing machine strapped to his back. In the middle, he stopped to wash several handkerchiefs, which he then gave to his waiting admirers. The courier quipped, Farini and Blondine should be canonized by the inhabitants of the falls. Periodically, they make these solitary places populous and are a perfect godsend to the hack drivers and vendors of lemonade. Crossing Niagara was not Hunt's only feat, however, as the great Farini would later become the first known white man to cross the Kalahari Desert on foot and survive. Proving that a woman can tiptoe as well as a man, in 1876, Maria Spelterini, an Italian acrobat who had been performing in circus acts since the age of three, became the first woman to cross the falls on a high wire, earning the sobriquet the heroine of Niagara. Like Blondine and the great Farini, she repeated her feat many times, and with more creative challenges, including, Leckert writes, once with her wrists and ankles manacled, once with a paper bag over her head, and once with peach baskets on her feet. And while her fearlessness was ferocious, it might have been the most impressive for a female funambulist, as the Brooklyn Daily Eagle described an extraordinary event in 1869. An exciting scene occurred the other day at Alcazar in Spain. Mademoiselle Rose Key, a rope dancer, was performing some jugglery feats, balancing daggers, lighting torches, etc., on the tightrope, when suddenly the cry, You're on fire! arose from the audience. A piece of burning stuff from one of the lighted torches had fallen on her head and set her long hair on fire. With one foot on the iron rope and another in the air, the woman did not lose her presence of mind. She passed her hand over her clothes and felt nothing. In your hair, cried the excited people. Mademoiselle Saki understood, and carrying her hand to her head, rapidly stifled the fire. She then continued her performance, as if nothing happened. To be sure, the activity had its dangers. In 1887, a local tightrope walker named Stephen Peer, who had crossed Niagara many times, fell to his death, attempting to cross at night. In a time of social media, when people will do virtually anything in order to get attention, we might think of ourselves as the ultimate hold-my-beer generation. But like so many things, the achievements of the past really put our, our present to shame. To be sure, there were daredevils before the 19th century, and there have been plenty since. In fact, the last person to cross Niagara Falls on a tightrope was famous funambulist Nick Walinda in 2012. And in 1974, French funambulist Philippe Petit became world famous when he, without permission, strung a wire between and tightrope walked across New York's more than 1,300-foot tall twin towers of the World Trade Center. But there was a unique draw in a time when people were doing things so dangerous that the spectators were literally wagering on whether they'd survive. Smithsonian Magazine notes that by the time that Bondine gave his last performance in 1896, he had crossed Niagara Falls on a tightrope more than 300 times, and overall had walked on his tightrope more than 10,000 miles. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.